everyone, and thank you so much for joining us from all over the world for our event celebration, ceremony, Zoroastrianism, and Nowruz, Easter and Passover. My name is Negar Siari. I'm a PhD candidate in linguistics and a teaching assistant in the Persian Studies program at Georgetown University. If at any time uh, in this webinar you'd like to pose a question, please use the Q&A box so that we can address that question during our designated Q&A portion. As always, questions are welcome in English, Finglish, and Persian. Now I have the pleasure of introducing the founder and director of the Persian Studies Program at Georgetown, Professor Farima Mostofi. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our attendees from around the world. On behalf of the Persian Studies Program at Georgetown University, I would like to welcome you to celebration and ceremony, Zoroastrianism and Nowruz, Easter and Passover, which is part of our Jolly Notes lecture series. I will add Nowruz Piruz to everyone celebrating the Persian New Year in two days. We greatly appreciate your attendance today and your continued interest in our cultural events. I would like to extend my gratitude to Shahzad and Farhad Jalinus, without whom these cultural events would not be possible. I now have the pleasure of introducing our panelists, Dr. Jamshid Shoksi, Dr. Maria Dorfler, Dr. Jason Mukhtarian, and our moderator, Dr. Neda Buruchi. Hi everyone, my name is Nila Bluchi, as Dr. Mustafi introduced me. Um, I am very excited to be here today, largely because you have a great panel um, that is going to speak to us about the different faiths celebrated in the Persianate worlds and a bit through the Middle East. And I think it's so important that scholars in Georgetown are having this panel because we continue to hear about sectarianism and strife and the sort of pathological disease of sectarianism in the Middle East, um, and not so much that it's a more recent phenomenon of the 20th century. And as we increasingly have uh, colleagues in anthropology and history and religious studies who are examining uh, secular governance and its contribution to sectarianism, uh, as well as interference and interventions in the Middle East and South Asia, uh, and North Africa, our panelists today are going to speak to us about the bridges uh, that existed prior to modernity, prior to the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries, and really how you have an interconnection of uh, faiths and peoples and places. And while this isn't to disregard differences and difficulties of the past, it is to recognize that there was the Middle East, the Persian eight worlds, the Arab worlds were places of vast cosmopolitanism before the word cosmopolitanism became popular. And so uh, it's with great, uh, I think, um, great aplomb that I introduce our panelists for today who have been uh, working on in these fields uh, of anthropology and religious studies and history uh, for decades and bring to us uh, their expertise today. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Jamshid Chaksky, who is Distinguished Professor, Department of Central Eurasian Studies, Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies at Inter uh, Indiana University. Uh, he is Distinguished Professor and former Chairperson of the Department of Central Eurasian Studies and of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures and former Director of the Middle Eastern Studies Program at Indiana University. Uh, Bloomington. He is an authority on Persia, the Middle East, Central Asia, South Asia, Zoroastrianism, Manichaeism, and Islam, and of religious minorities in the Middle East, Central, and South Asia. Uh, he was nominated by the U.S. President and confirmed by the U.S. Senate as a member of the Council overseeing the National Endowment for the Humanities, and he has held fellowships at Harvard, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, NEH, Guggenheim, numerous others. Uh, he is a consulting editor for the Encyclopedia Euronica and the author of Purity and Pollution in Zoroastrianism, 
uh, conflict and cooperation in medieval Iranian society and evil, good, and gender in Zoroastrian religious history. Uh, he has been in all sorts of uh, popular publications in addition to his scholarly publications. We have also Dr. Jason Mokhtarian, who is Associate Professor, Department of Near Eastern Studies at Cornell University. Uh, he is the holder of the Herbert and Stephanie Newman Chair in Hebrew and Jewish Literature in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Cornell, and he is an expert in Persian Jewish history, and in particular, the study of the Babylonian Talmud in its Zoroastrian and Sanas excuse me, Sasanian context. He is the author of two books, The Culture of the Talmud in Ancient Iran and Medicine in the Talmud. And finally, but not uh, least, is Dr. Maria Dorfler, Assistant Professor of Late Antiquity, Department of Religious Studies at Yale University. Uh, her work focuses on the exposition of authoritative texts, whether scripture, law, or philosophical writings by individuals and communities in times of crisis. Her recent monograph, Jephthah's Daughter, Sarah's Son, The Death of Children in Late Antiquity, uh, received the American Academy of Religions uh, Best First Book in the History of Religions Prize. She's recently completed a manuscript on the intersection of writing law and the creation of sacred histories, and is working on a book uh, on Syriac funerary hymnography. So uh, I hope you all enjoy what is sure to be a great panel. Um, and after our panelists give their presentations, we have a lengthy Q and A uh, time allotted. Uh, so thank you to everybody for joining us. And we will start with Dr. Chosky. Thank you so much for having me today. I hope everyone can hear me. If you cannot hear me, let me know. If not, give me a thumbs up so I know that Everything's coming through clearly. Okay, presuming that everyone can hear me, uh, I'm going to talk today briefly about Zoroastrianism and Nowruz. So Nowruz, or the new day, falling annually on the vernal or spring equinox, March 20th or 21st, is the most important Zoroastrian communal festival and marks the beginning of the new solar year. However, Nauruz was not mentioned in the Avesta or Zoroastrian scripture. The origins of Nauruz may go back to the Achaemenian or Persian Empire of the 6th through 4th centuries BC or BCE. Those Iranians likely assimilated the Babylonian Akitu festival, which marked the annual Resh Shatim or beginning of the lunar year, symbolizing rebirth of the world after the vernal equinox with the lengthening of daylight and the recommencing of agriculture. Those Achaemenian kings adopted a solar calendar in which probably Nauru's commemorated Aura Mazda or Ormus, the wise lords, regenerative power over the cold, dark winter of Angramani, Ariman, or the evil spirit. Nauru's came to have an autumnal counterpart as well. The festival of Meragan or the feast of Mithra, Meher, the worship worthy spirit of covenants and contracts who was venerated by the Persians as well. The Visoramin romantic epic preserved in classical Persian or Farsi from the 11th century of the common era, but based on Arsacid or Parthian originals from prior to the second century of the common era describes Nauru's festivities. A Manichaean source from late Parthian or early Sasanian times around the year 224 of the common era alludes to Nauru's as well. The festival was first recorded in a Zoroastrian text, the Middle Persian or Pahlavi Narangistan, or ritual code where it is mentioned as Nogros. That text transmitted for centuries was written down eventually during the 10th century of the common era. Al-Biruni, writing the late 10th century of the common era, attributed the standardization of Nauru's to the Sasanian king of kings Hormuz I during the latter part of the 3rd century. In Iranian law, for example, as preserved in the Shahnameh, a book of kings, Establishment of Nauru's, however, is attributed back 
to a legendary ruler, Yima Kashaita, or Jamshid, the fourth ruler of the legendary Peshtadian of First Dynasty. And if you could have figure one come up on the screen, you will see a, a, a Safavid illustration of the court of uh, Yima Jamshid. And I do hope that you are able to see that image. There we go. So Jamshid seated over here in his royal court, at least in the Safavid version of this. Uh, uh, but uh, Yima, uh, actually an Indo-European le legendary figure, the Ymir, uh, Yemo, uh, Indian Yama, eventually Ram Rama, uh, in Iran becoming a Jam, Jamshid, uh, is supposed in this Iranian legendary tradition to have instituted Nauruz together with, of course, uh, vastly elaborating ancient Iranian society. But that, of course, is all legend. Uh, but yeah, back to uh, the festival itself. Immediately preceding Nauruz, are the 10 Zoroastrian days that are known, known as Ham, Hamas Patamaide or Favardigar. Those days are now divided into two Tanji or five day segments by Iranian Zoroastrians and are known as Muktad by Parsi Zoroastrians of India and elsewhere. Those days commemorate all the immortal souls or the Fravashis, hence Fravardigan, uh, Fravashis or immortal souls of humans among Zoroastrians. So the 10 days before the New Year's, I used to commemorate one's ancestors. And then one comes to the new, a new, uh, new Year's Day itself. After the Islamization of Iran, Muslims developed the right of Chahar Shambash Suri or Scarlet Wednesday on the last Wednesday of the Persian solar year. So within that 10 day period preceding the New Year. And in this uh, 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 festival of Jahar uh, Shanbeh Suri, evening customs include jumping over fire while symbolically casting misfortunes of the year into flames and assimilating the fire's luminosity. However, Zoroastrians regard such acts as polluting fire, you know, as jumping over it, possibly polluting it, uh, because they believe that fire is holy and the pure sun of the deity our master. So Zoroastrians in Iran and elsewhere do not perform this act. At Nauru's, contemporary Iranians, both Muslims and Zoroastrians, set a, set a half-seen table. If you can have the next image, be oh, thank you. Half-seen table of seven symbolic items whose names start with the letter S or seen as seen in this image. Sabze or a sprouting vegetable, Saranu or wheat germ pudding, Sanjed or oleaster olives, Sarke or vinegar, Seeb or apple, Seer or garlic, and Sumac. Uh, a book of wisdom, a mirror of reflection, a clock marking the passage of time, and candles to throw light are often included. The number seven for this probably goes back to the Zoroastrian heptad or seven Amesha spentas or immort holy immortals, essentially archangels. Among the Parsis, whose Persian Zoroastrian ancestors migrated to Iran after the seventh century to continue their faith and customs, the spring equinox Nauruz is termed Jamshedi Nauruz or the new year established by the legendary King Jamshid. On that day, each house is cleaned and decorated with flower gardens, uh, sorry, flower garlands, a feast of meat, fish, vegetables, rice, lentils, and sweets is prepared and enjoyed. Prayers are recited by laity at home and by magi or priests at Jeshan or Thanksgiving services in fire temples. Next image, please. There you can see uh, in Mumbai, Bombay, a priest performing one of these Jashan ceremonies. And if you look closely, you'll see the little fire altar. You'll see fruits that are being consecrated in prayer. You'll see frankincense uh, and sandalwood for offering to the fire. And these consecrated uh, foods are shared among the devotees as a chashni or communal meal thereafter. 
One final comment uh, can, uh, well, uh, can be talk, uh, said about the Parsi celebration. The traditional Parsi calendar fell out of sync uh, with, the, with the solar calendar due to lack of intercalation after the Arab conquest of Iran in the seventh century. Consequently, for Parsis, the original spring equinox day for Nauru's now falls in August. And so the Parsis celebrate essentially two New Year's, uh, the vernal equinox or junction in Nauru's and then the, uh, uh, the lapsing Nauru's that now falls in the fall. Essentially, they get to cel uh, celebrate twice, which uh, one can hardly uh, criticize. One should certainly commence such celebrations. Nauru's celebrations of course, spread from ancient Iran to Central Asia, to Turkey and North India among Zoroastrians, and after the seventh century CE among Muslims. In all those countries, Nowruz is still the foremost societal event. Thank you very much for listening to this brief presentation. Nowruz Mubarak, Sal Mubarak. Great, and I think with that, we'll head over to Dr. Mukhtarian. So hello, everybody. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, first of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the Georgetown Persian Studies Program for the invitation to participate in this wonderful event. Um, and uh, thank you all to everybody who's uh, attending the webinar. Persian civilization has represented one of the world's most important melting pots of religious activity for thousands of years. Zoroastrians and Jews in particular have lived side by side for much of this time as Persia has been a homeland to the Jewish people going back over 2,500 years. In 539 BCE, the first Persian Achaemenid king, Cyrus the Great, established a vast empire that stretched over territories from the Mediterranean to India and ruled over many religious and ethnic populations including, of course, the exiled Jews in Babylonia, whom, as we know from the Bible, the monarch permitted to return to their homeland in Israel and to rebuild the Jerusalem temple. Centuries later, the Sasanian Empire, whose official religion was Zoroastrianism, came to political power and governed over many religious communities, including the rabbis who produced the Babylonian Talmud, the vast compendium of rabbinic law that is the most important corpus in the Jewish sacred canon and to this day is still the basis of normative Jewish behavior. After the rise of Islam and throughout the medieval era, Zoroastrians, Jews, Christians, and Muslims all continue to interact and live as neighbors in Persia, including in today's Islamic Republic of Iran. Suffice it to say that within Persian history, all of these religions have influenced one another while at the same time maintaining their own traditions and identities. In the case of Judaism, there's been a great deal of acculturation to the Persian heritage, including in the celebration of Passover. The eight day long Jewish holiday of Passover begins on the 15th of the Hebrew month of Nisan, or the month of spring as it's known, uh, since it marks the beginning of the spring, and hence is usually around the same time as Noruz. Uh, this year, Passover is a bit late. It actually doesn't begin until April 15th, uh, so it is, it is a little bit, it, it's still a few weeks away. For the Jewish people, the holiday of Passover commemorates their ancestors' liberation from slavery in Egypt over 3,200 years ago, as recorded in the biblical book of Exodus. According to the Bible, on the 15th of Nisan, God inflicted the 10th plague upon the Egyptians, killing of the firstborn, but passed over the homes of the Israelites, hence Passover. Jews gather with their families for a ritual meal on Passover with a Seder plate on which are placed among other symbolic foods, some bitter herbs with celery or lettuce, which are eaten in dipped vinegar to represent the hardship of slavery, and also to read from the prayer book, the Haggadah, which contains biblical and Talmudic texts and outlines the many rituals and prayers of the holiday. Passover is also known as the Festival of Unleavened Bread to symbolize the fact that those Israelites fleeing from Egypt did not have time to allow their bread to leaven. On Passover, uh, up until today, Jews eat unleavened flatbread called matzah, 
uh, and avoid eating any food with rising grains, including pasta, breads, and cakes, uh, and any other foods of that category. And interestingly, similar to the ritual of cleaning the house for Noruz, Passover also entails thoroughly cleaning the house from top to bottom, and especially the kitchen, to remove any trace of such grains. Now, over the centuries, Persian Jews have developed their own unique customs around these rituals, which differ from Jews from other parts of the world, especially those of European descent. First of all, Persian Jews do not forbid the eating of rice on Passover, as other Jews do, given how central it is to their own cuisine. Of course, having such a festive meal without rice would be blasphemous to a Persian. And this goes to show how Jewish law often gives way to Persian customs. Moreover, given the difficulties of securing kosher foods in a predominantly Muslim country, the women in a pious Jewish household, say in the middle of the 20th century, would not only be responsible for thoroughly cleaning the home and purifying every single utensil by placing it in boiled water over, or over fire, but they were also forced to prepare all the Passover foods entirely from scratch, including salt and nuts by grinding them by hand and rinsing them over and over again. With respect to the rice that's eaten, they would diligently check every single grain to confirm that there were no foreign objects in them. Perhaps the most famous and unique Persian Jewish ritual on Passover is during the recitation of the song Dayenu, which in Hebrew means it would have been enough or enough. Traditionally, this is a celebratory song that praises God for giving the Jewish people what he gave them, and that that by itself would have been enough of a generous miracle. So for example, one line from the song reads, if God had given us the Torah, but had not brought us into the land of Israel, Dayenu, that would have been sufficient for us. Now, when reciting this song, Persian Jews take out plates of long green onions and begin hitting each other with them while saying Dayenu. I can tell you that in my family, this family feud would go on for a while while everyone making with everyone making sure to whip young and old alike and to do so in good cheer and humor. The idea here is that this act of whipping symbolizes the whipping that our ancestors felt when they were slaves in Egypt all while saying enough. And again, this is something that's unique to Persian Jewish culture. Now, finally, there's one other Passover tradition that's unique to Persian Jews, uh, which may have been influenced by Nowruz celebrations, and that this is on the eighth night of Passover, the last night, uh, called in Persian Shabbosal, or the evening of the year. Uh, this marks a joyful celebration when Jews would, for instance, plan weddings or bridal engagements, and when they could now break the dietary restrictions of the holiday, which they would do by eating all sorts of dairies and pastries and bread. Now in Iran, many Jews would avoid dairy products during Passover because they were likely not made by a Jew and thus weren't considered to be kosher. And so it was an occasion on this eighth night to now be able to eat those foods again. Now, uh, I, I don't have any direct ev evidence of this, but it seems likely that this celebration was related to the festive atmosphere of Nowruz. So in the end, what I hope to have illustrated with these couple of examples is that there are numerous Passover rituals that are unique to Persian Jews and that represent the historical impact that Persian civilization has had on the Jewish people throughout their history. And allow me to conclude my remarks by briefly pointing to a debate in the Talmudic tractate on Passover called Pesachim, where the rabbis of Babylonia around 500 CE are discussing whether local customs should be followed even when they do not conform to Jewish law. In fact, one of these debates, which is too arcane to go into detail now, surrounds the preparation of rice and probably uh, rice bread is being meant here and whether it needs to be separated from the priestly portion of the challah. Now, according to the summary opinion, the Talmud says that Jews are in fact obligated to follow the local customs that are established by their local leaders and rabbis, which it supports through a verse from the book of Proverbs chapter one, verse eight, which says, do not forsake the teaching of your mother. 
Today, although most Persian Jews now live in the diaspora, including in the United States and in Israel, it seems, it seems that the continuation of the unique Persian Passover rituals that I described all follow Talmudic law by paying homage to the customs of their ancestors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mahlodian. Um, Dr. Dorfler. Thank you so much. It is an absolute honor to be here. It is an honor to be in conversation with my brilliant colleagues and also this truly stunning audience. We're already seeing the Q&As that are coming in from you. Thank you for being here and for your thoughtful engagement. It's entirely appropriate that I am the last person of the three of us to speak because Easter is in many ways the Johnny Cup lately, the new kid of the block, if you will, when it comes to spring festivals. And it accordingly should not surprise us that this deeply connected with its more ancient colleagues, that is to say, Nehruz and Passover. The connection to the latter is, uh, in fact, already part of the origin stories of Easter. As many of you will know, Easter is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus in the aftermath of his execution by the Roman imperial government. There is for contemporary Christians, both in Syriac communities and in more Western settings, a period of preparation that anticipates that resurrection, Lent in the West and the Great Lent in Eastern Christian communities, that culminates in a week that traces the progression of events leading up to that execution and resurrection, events that closely parallel what the canonical gospels depict as the preparation of Jesus and his followers for Passover. In the first century CE, Jerusalem and the temple were significant focal points for Jews to gather on Passover, and that of course includes Jesus and his followers, all of whom would have identified as Jewish. There's really no mission to the Gentiles until after the resurrection. The Gospel of Matthew alongside the Gospel of John um, really is the most popular gospel in early Christian communities. And it narrates the beginnings of all this as follows. I'm now going to share my screen and I have to confess to you that I'm doing this in large part such that you might see some beautiful illustrations from Syriac Christian manuscripts, but also so that I can illustrate a few quotations for all of our benefit. So as I've suggested, the Gospel of Matthew narrates here as follows. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says my time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover meal. Those of you familiar with Syriac Christianity, I should also mention that I've chosen this reading from Matthew because it closely parallels the text of the Dia Tesseron, the gospel harmony in use uh, in early Syriac Christian communities. It is this Passover meal that becomes what Christians call the Last Supper, the final occasion for Jesus to dine with his disciples and the model for Eucharistic celebrations. This link with the celebration of Passover also informs a lot of the logic of these so-called passion narratives. The presence of the crowds in Jerusalem, the alleged practice of the Roman governor to release one prisoner, even in John's gospel, which follows a different chronology than the uh, uh, rest of the canonical gospels, the rationale for removing Jesus's body from the cross. For much of the earliest centuries of Christianity, the celebration of Easter accordingly was linked closely to Passover, making the 14th day of the month of Nisan, the spring month, as we've already heard, uh, and also in this case, the day of the Jewish Passover, also the day of the Easter celebration for particularly a number of Christian communities in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, and farther east, including Persia. The so-called Council of Nicaea in 325 puts an end to this, or at least attempts to put an end to this. This council is remembered for a number of important decisions and frankly, simply for the fact that it was the first worldwide, but again, worldwide in quotation marks, gathering of Christian bishops under the auspices of the Roman Emperor Constantine. One of those important decisions is conveyed in a letter about the council's decisions the so-called synodal letter. I'll share a snippet with you here. 
we further proclaim to you the good news of the agreement of the bishops gathered at the council concerning the Holy Easter, that this matter also has been rightly settled thanks to your prayers, so that all our brothers in the East, so specifically thinking about places including Persia, who formerly followed the custom of the Jews are henceforth to celebrate the most sacred feast of Easter at the same time with the Romans and yourselves and all those who have observed Easter from the beginning. In other words, this council decided to officially disyoke Easter from Passover, despite their linkage in the actual origins of the feast, all in the interest of uniting churches around the same annual Easter celebration. Now, it bears saying that historically, both of these stipulations that all Christians celebrate Easter on the same day and that at Easter not coincide with Passover have failed. On the one hand, the date of Easter is calculated differently in the West and in the East uh, following the Gregorian versus the Julian calendar. So that, um, say, for example, the Easter uh, for Protestants, for Roman Catholics, but also it must be said for the Assyrian Church of the East will take place this year on April 17, because their calculations, again, are based on the Gregorian calendar. And in Eastern Orthodox and Syrian Orthodox community, Easter this year falls on April 24th, so a whole week later. On the other hand, because Easter and Passover, and for that matter, Nuhus, are all calculated according to the Lumi Solar calendar, most years there is, in fact, overlap between Easter and Passover, and both fall, as we've already heard, quite close to Nuhus as well. As you might expect, in ancient religious communities, this created a space of competition between the celebrations and the communities who valorized those celebrations, as well as cross-pollination, ritually speaking, as we've already heard. This is particularly true for Syrian Christians who lived in very close quarters with their Jewish and Zoroastrian neighbors, and whose religious traditions, as we've already seen in this synodal letter from the Council of Nicaea, arguably bore a stronger imprint of an early Jewish Christian or Christian Jewish symbiosis. This became particularly pressing because Easter was not just the most important feast of the Christian calendar, far more important, particularly in those early centuries um, than Christmas, for example, but also a time for Christian initiation. The Easter vigil, that is to say, the night from Saturday to Easter Sunday, which traditionally has been a time for Christians to wait and watch, is also that locus classicus for baptism. In other words, for quite a long time, this is the night where if you wish to be fully admitted into the Christian community, you would go through the rites and would be received by the congregation. This is a, a very powerful experience, I think, even in a contemporary setting. I just wanted to show you a very brief uh, image here from uh, taken a few years ago from the Easter Vigil in Jerusalem at the Anastasis Basilica, the Basilica of the Resurrection. Uh, and what you're seeing below is just the candles of people awaiting the coming of dawn and also awaiting, of course, of the baptisms to emerge. That's to say, those who have been newly baptized. At the same time, though, in ancient lectionaries, Easter Vigil is simply swathed in readings from the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. In Syrian Christian communities, 12 lengthy excerpts from the Old Testament, predominantly the prophets, are being read, all arranged to convey the central message of what scholars sometimes call supersessionism. That is to say, the idea that with the arrival of Jesus, Judaism apart from Christianity became obsolete. So as you might expect, this is a time of year where in early Christian communities, the rhetoric against other religious communities increases dramatically. During Passover, for example, um, we know that Ephraim, who is perhaps the most significant poet of Syriac Christianity, had choirs chant hymns for his community that included verses like the following. And here I'm going to give you a tiny snippet of one such hymn. Let us not let us eat, my brothers, along with the remedy of life, the unleavened bread of the Jewish people, like a deadly poison. For the blood of Christ is mingled and resides in the unleavened bread of the Jewish people and in our Christian offering. Whoever takes it in the offering takes the medicine of life. Whoever eats it with the Jewish people takes the deadly poison. 
For the blood of Jesus for which they cried out, let it fall upon them, is mingled in their holidays and in their Sabbath, and he who joins in their feasts, he too is affected by the sprinkling of Jesus' blood. There's a lot to unpack here, and we can do that later if you're interested, but the essential message here is very clear. Jews and Jewish observance is bad, Christian observance is good. We may also need to attend to, however, what made Ephraim feel pressed to actually present that message, and indeed many of Ephraim's contemporaries to present that message. And it has to do with the fact that particularly in these contexts, particularly in Sasanian settings, there is profound interpenetration of ritual observations uh, of people attending multiple festivals um, without a sense that they're compromising their own religious identity. But this is nevertheless what Christians in Middle East uh, and Persia in the fourth and fifth and subsequent centuries would be hearing as they prepared for Easter. Now, on the other hand, of course, Easter becomes an occasion for anti-Christian violence as well. In Syrian Christian communities today, for example, the Friday after Easter is still known as Friday of the Confessor in recollection of the death of Shimon Basabaye and other Christians in either three, in the 340s. Shimon was a bishop of Seleucia, that is to say the capital of the Persian empire in the fourth century. And Ashapur II, one of the most important uh, Sassanid Persian rulers, Shimon and other Christians were allegedly arrested for refusing to raise a double tax from the Christian community. They were challenged to worship the sun and when they refused, executed on the Friday before Easter, that is to say, the day assigned to the commemoration of Jesus' crucifixion. The historical sources surrounding this are all problematic, not least of all since martyr stories are something of a genre in early Christian writings. And part of that genre is trying to make martyrs conform as closely as possible to Jesus' example. But Syrian Christian communities to this day recollect this time surrounding Easter as also connected with trials and challenges to their faith identity. I got to this point in my remarks and I realized that I wanted to end on a somewhat more cheerful note. And to this end, I wanted to show you another glimpse at one of Ephraim's hymns, also written in anticipation of Easter. This is a hymn that begins with recapturing the Passover narrative and particularly the rejoicing after the liberation of the Jews from Egypt. And here uh, Ephraim goes on to say, in the month of Nisan, the enclosed flowers come out and the children come out of their rooms. At this feast rejoice together children and flowers in their beautiful Lord. The lilies breasts bore flowers and the breasts of women bear children. They were afraid to cry when they were enslaved in Egypt. Their voices were made very small like their waists. In Nisan, the eloquent begetter of songs, the children also were fearless. This nature imagery, the celebration of spring with the budding flowers and growing vines and springing lamps, stands at the heart of Syrian Christian celebration of Easter. Like Passover and Nehruz, it is quintessentially a spring festival, celebrating new life and new hope, the resurrection of Jesus alongside the return of life that comes to agrarian society, and even to those of us who do not live in agrarian societies anymore during this time of year. Thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much to our panelists. And I think we have a good, clear idea of not only the competition and contestation amongst and between the religions, but also the shared assimilations and practices during these celebrations and ceremonies. Um, and so that gives a, a, a fuller, more rich uh, idea of what life may have been at different times in the past. We have a number of questions um, for our panelists, and I thought that um, we would start with, I think Behram has a question that basically asks, could the panelists comment on the Christian traditions of fasting during this time of the year or of avoiding meats and the alternative of straight specific types of fasting? It reminds me, he says, of the Zarusri traditions of, um, as you see there, uh, Maria um, Bahnam Mahino, avoiding meat and the Muslim tradition of Ramadan, which starts in about two weeks. Um, so I'll open that up for panelists to answer. 
I will let my colleagues take a first step since I've just- Okay, been- fair enough. Let me start with the Zoroastrian part of that. Now, fasting is, uh, has traditionally not been part of the Zoroastrian practice. Absten- abstinence uh, uh, is not regarded as within the Zoroastrian tradition as constructive. Uh, you know, the enjoying within moderation, all the benefits of life are highly commended by, particularly by the medieval Magi. And so uh, the, while there are occasional references, for example, to uh, uh, the abstinence, let's say from meat in a very late uh, uh, Middle Persian texts, by and large, these seen read traditions picked up in India. Uh, fasting, of course, let's keep in mind, was very strong among the Manichaean tradition. Uh, but all, let's also keep in mind that by and large, Manichaeism in its traditional sense was wiped out in Iran and driven to the West and into Central Asia. And with that, I'll pass it on to Maria and Jason. Uh, so I would just say that um, obviously there are many important moments in the Jewish calendar where one is supposed to fast. Uh, Passover is not one of them. Uh, in fact, it probably goes against actually the essence of what Passover is supposed to be, which is a joyful celebration. Having said that, there is actually um, a relatively obscure uh, fast day before Passover, the day before Passover, which is supposed to be done by firstborn males, uh, essentially in commemoration of the 10th plague, where Pharaoh um, is condemned by God to have firstborn males of Egypt die. Uh, I don't know how many people actually practice this. I'm sure among Orthodox Jews today it is it is done, uh, but it's not something that you know is done uh, you know ubiquitously uh, across let's say sec- more secular minded Jews. Um, but uh, so yeah, I think I think I would just leave it leave it at that and uh, turn it over to Maria to see if she has any anything to say about this specifically the question about Christian fasting. Thank you so much to Dr. Shotsky and uh, Mukhtarian. So um, as um, Baram uh, in fact knows, f- and as I've mentioned uh, in my brief remarks, fasting uh, in the weeks leading up to Easter is a practice that is in fact quite ancient. We have early evidence for that coming from the fourth century um, where there are texts like the apostolic constitutions, that's essentially a church order. It's a collection of uh, um, rules for administrating Christian communities. It's in fact fairly explicit that there are only a handful of foods that are permitted during the um, during the period of Lent, that is to say the 40 days leading up to Easter. And those include bread, they include water, they include salt and vegetables, um, with uh, wine and meat being rather explicitly forbidden. Uh, there's a very lengthy thread that we might unpack here about the prevalence of wine and meat in most people's homes in that, in that particular period. We're totally not going to get into that. But suffice it to say, this sense of fasting Uh, as a period of purification in anticipation of Easter, and particularly the emphasis of that um, during the final week leading up to Easter Sunday, is something that goes back quite a long ways. We see um, in the Greek world, as well as the Syriac speaking world, and even in the Latin West, in uh, the early fifth century, uh, Augustine of Hippo, one of the most influential bishops on the Western side of things, says that the entire world is fasting uh, during this particular period. So a very widespread practice that uh, indeed even precedes um, the advent and rise of Islam uh, and uh, the concomitant practices. Fantastic. Thank you. And I think also maybe another question um, from Ali, maybe Dr. Choksi would like to start with this um, as well. He says, uh, I'm from Kazakhstan, where we too celebrate Noruz, what I assume is a Turkic uh, derivation. I was wondering if you have any sources or would just speak to us about how the celebration made its way into Central Asia. Fair enough. Uh, for, for parts of Central Asia, uh, while the celebration of Nauruz can be documented in pre-Islamic times, uh, the, the, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, come across sources that actually track how it spread. Uh, it is most likely that it spread uh, through mercantile contacts with traders, uh, Zoroastrians, uh, uh, Jews, Christians, etc., who went back and forth on the Silk Road and, and took their practices with them. Remember that Nauruz, uh, you know, 
while you know it's sort of religious links may be to Zoroastrianism, very quickly becomes the quintessential Iranian New Year and the New Year for all Persian, so speak, Persian speaking uh, and other Iranian language speaking groups. So it, it spread across, uh, across Central Asia and eventually even to Turkey as well. Um, it, it's not surprising. This is something with, which uh, where people moving around, resettling, are taking the customs uh, with them. Um, and our next question um, from Ms. Jalanus is, Easter always falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon after Noruz. How, uh, do you have an idea of how this timing came about and was decided? Noruz is always at the vernal equinox, but Easter's date moves around. Yeah, thank you for the question. The calculation of uh, Easter is actually fairly complicated. And, uh, um, and as I've suggested already, functions differently according to the use of calendar, whether Julian or Gregorian. And in some ways, um, the direct link is um, uh, originally, as I've suggested, already with Passover, that is to say the 14th uh, of the month of Nisan. Um, but, uh, in the intervening time, um, calculations were sought to be generalized uh, somewhat unsuccessfully because we actually have a fair amount of evidence, particularly from Christian in Persia, who continued to hold hold on to this particular link um, with Passover, that uh, um, sought to really just link that specifically to the equinox. So um, as you, uh, as I've suggested, e uh, Easter is determined on the basis of these lunar uh, solar cycles. Um, that's to say, you know, a lunar year consists of 30 days, a 29 day lunar month. Um, and uh, the full moon that uh, appears during the month of Nisan, that is to say, uh, the Paschal full moon, is, uh, uh, in other words, really that, that link to which traditions refer themselves. And along these lines, um, I'm going to take a question out of order here. And so if any of the three of you would be able to speak on our eggs, uh, which we understand generally to symbolize fertility, the only shared symbol uh, or object in these celebrations. Or are they not, is it not conversely? Well, I, if I may refer to, you know, Jason's, uh, uh, you know, note about the very, uh, shall we say, uh, the practice of whipping each other, uh, which is both commemorative of uh, hardship, but also then transformed into a nice family, friendly, mirthful uh, gathering. One can see the presence essentially of sabzi, of vegetation uh, in, these, uh, in these celebrations. I'm going to jump in and I'm going to say that eggs actually, uh, while they play a huge role in Easter celebrations, if you find yourself anywhere in the Western world, you walk into a drugstore, you will be overwhelmed by plastic manifestations in all the colors of the rainbow and some colors you did not know existed. Um, they're actually not something that has a truly ancient origin. They seem to make an appearance during the medieval period. Um, and uh, there have been efforts to link this with various festivals in the Roman um, uh, in the Roman period but uh, it truly the origins of it are relatively poorly understood but are not as ancient as a lot of other Easter customs on the other hand um, there are a significant number of other connections on the one hand we've already heard the processes of cleaning the house in many regards this is something that for Christians begins already with the beginning of Lent that is to say with the beginning of that period of fasting leading up to Easter um, some of you will know for example that uh, uh, many different Christian traditions emphasize the using up of the um, comestibles, the particular food types that cannot be used during that period of fasting on the day just before. Um, and uh, um, you will see that in the context of Shrove Tuesday or Mardi Gras uh, and variety of other guises on that. The other thing that's worth saying is that the celebration of Norouche is something that 
deeply shapes how Syrian Christians think about big celebrations, and particularly big celebrations um, of, um, uh, of Jesus or of the deity. So for example, there are um, Syrian Christian accounts of uh, the Magi coming to, uh, um, to Jesus. I realize this is not a Christmas session, it's an Easter session, that are very closely modeled on what the writers would have witnessed and would have encountered in the context of court visitations uh, in the Sassanid Empire, um, of the bringing of gifts and uh, of sort of specific venerations. So there's a lot of interpenetrations in customs, even if they're not quite as explicit as we might sometimes like. So in terms of the, the Passover Seder, uh, there is in fact an egg that's placed symbolically uh, on, the, on the plate. Uh, this, as far as I know, is, is symbolic of the former ritual of sacrificing the Paschal Lamb, which the ancient Jews would do uh, before the destruction of the temple in the year 70 CE as part of the Passover ritual. So obviously in 70 CE with the destruction of the temple, um, sacrificing animals in any which way uh, became obsolete and was largely replaced by uh, other rituals such as prayer. Uh, and so this is merely a commemoration of that as far as I know. Um, so I think I think it's fairly straightforward. Again, it's just one of the symbolic elements that is used uh, it, it, to, to, to commemorate in terms of memory. Um, so I, I, I never thought about the connection if there was any between that and the Easter egg. Uh, I don't know if there is any connection, but it's something that I've never thought about. So I, I would be curious to think if there was some sort of connection more broadly between, between the egg. Although eggs, obviously, right, in many world religions are going to be used symbolically for all sorts of purposes, especially fertility, and you find it in ancient magic. So um, this is one of those questions about uh, whether similarities are, in fact, uh, indicative of influence or whether it's just coincidental that there's this um, symbolic food like an egg that's used across many world religions for a variety of symbolic purposes. Uh, but in Passover, it, it does represent uh, what I described, correct? Do you mind if I very briefly jump in again? Because yeah. I see another question being raised by Kimia in the chat about uh, the story about Mary Magdalene's miracle. Um, this is, in fact, a rather charming um, uh, a rather charming narrative that has Mary Magdalene, um, you know, approach the Roman emperor and uh, um, share the message of the resurrection. Um, and uh, then, you know, being told that a uh, human being cannot resurrect it in the same way that, uh, uh, you know, in the context, um, in, in the same way that uh, um, an, an egg is, uh, um, that an egg is uh, cannot return um, uh, to life from dead. Um, and uh, the egg that uh, Mary Magdalene brings uh, in this narrative um, is uh, uh, promptly turns red. And uh, it is a miracle and is a witness to the resurrection. Um, this is a narrative that uh, does not emerge in early Christian communities. It is, uh, in some ways, what we might call an ex post facto explanation of the use of eggs. Um, in other words, uh, this is a story that arises to explain uh, a pre-existing custom, that is to say, the custom of associating eggs with Easter. Thank you so much for that, Maria. Uh, we're actually, if you don't mind, Dr. Mukhtarin, we're also going to come back to you a second to ask you a little bit, as well as uh, Dr. Dorfler, a little bit more about the enthusiasm and Easter, celebrate, celebrating Easter in Israel, as well as the extent to which the celebration of Noruz happens in Israel, um, and if it happens with some uh, sort of profound enthusiasm or widespread enthusiasm. Uh, is, I don't know if the question is specifically um, about the Persian community in Israel or whether it's uh, Israelis more broadly. I'm assuming it's about the Persian community. I mean, presumably, yes. Um, I, I've never lived in Israel for an extended period of time, so I don't want to speak to you know, a whole, a whole uh, culture there. But yes, I mean, what I can tell you is that from my experiences in America among uh, the Persian Jewish diaspora is that Noruz is still celebrated. And it is, it is, again, one of those sort of markers of um, maintaining one's connection with one's homeland. And 
you know, a lot of Persian Jews continue to feel connected to their Iranian culture, right? It, it's, it's very much still a part of them. And I think that this is one of the expressions of that. And uh, I think that the vast majority of people that I know, uh, family members and, and friends who come from Iran continue to celebrate Nowruz. Uh, it's, it's one of those, again, one of those celebratory moments that uh, even if it's just setting up the half scene, that it is one of these special moments in the calendar where one gets to remember where one comes from and to celebrate. Um, in Israel, I would imagine that, yes, it's probably also done there. I would be surprised if it's not. So I hope that at least, you know, touches a little bit on my impressions. Um, I can tell you that in my own family, my, my mother uh, does it every year. So, so yes, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, Maria, did you? I will simply to... piggyback to say that the same could be said for a lot of Syrian Christian communities, mm -hmm. um, most of them, of course, now uh, in the diaspora. Um, but I uh, know many Syrian Christian families in the United States for whom uh, Nowruz is significant for precisely the reasons that you've highlighted here, um, which is to say it is a very deep tie with the homeland um, and with the people who share that, um, who share those experiences. Yes, I could just um, add it's true for all Iranians or diaspora or Iranian diaspora communities, past or present. Um, you know, like I said, the, if you look at the uh, Parsi community of India, going back to like probably the seventh century of the Kalmyra, Nauru's is central. So this is true for every Iranian expatriate community, irrespective of, of religion. Thank you, Dr. Shotsky. Um, and along those lines, I think that there is uh, some questions on a little bit more about Zoroastrianism and the Charshamba Suri and this idea that um, there's a question here that says, well, let me rephrase it, in that is char jumping over fire uh, historically part of Charshamba Suri or is this a more modern uh, sort of adaptation uh, for Noru's? Like I mentioned, the celebration itself uh, is not documented uh, among Zoroastrians, uh, uh, and uh, it appears to be an Islamic development. Uh, as I mentioned, jumping over the flame would be regarded as possibly polluting the flame, you know, uh, dirt, dust uh, from you, from your shoes falling into it, which also goes to one of the other questions here about yes. why, why, do, why are the priests wearing face coverings? Uh, they're, they're, they're covering their nose and their mouth so their breath and saliva when speaking doesn't fall on the flames and therefore contaminate, pollute, ritually pollute the flames. Uh, so uh, Zoroastrians in Iran do not. Now, some of them, of course, the younger generation may join in the celebration with their Muslim uh, fellow, uh, of, with their Muslim friends, but by and large, they do not. Uh, as for the Islamic regime, well, the Islamic regime does not like mass gatherings, popular gatherings, uh, period. And uh, it's not just for this particular celebration, but uh, the Zoroastrian community in, in Iran often has to send out notices uh, requesting uh, their Muslim neighbors not to join the traditional Iranian Zoroastrian festivals, even secular ones, because the regime uh, regards uh, such gatherings as ultimately, shall we say, venues where the authority of the regime could be questioned. But that's a political dimension of modern times and, and of this current regime. Um, and then there's another question about sort of the commonality of pomegranates. Um, if you would sort of address maybe the, uh, sort of uh, our questioner uses the word reverence, so the reverence to the pomegranate in Jewish and Zoroastrian traditions. Uh, so for you see it on the half scene table, the Sofra Meragon, um, and, and so throughout history and into the customs and celebrations we're discussing. Um, so if you, if anyone would like to speak to sort of how it is uh, the sort of the proliferation or the prominence of the pomegranate in celebrations and ceremonies. I think Maria, Jason, and I can all talk about, Maria already talked about this sort of cross-dimensional aspect of uh, certain symbols in religions. Uh, and, uh, and the pomegranate is just one of these. Uh, you know, uh, 
something that always struck me when I saw pomegranates uh, actually growing, you know, on uh, trees in Iran is they burst open and this uh, sticky uh, 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 juice sort of pours out. Uh, as you know, again, this issue of fertility and all and life and all the rest that goes across. Uh, there was, you know, we buy pomegranates in stores and we get this hard thing that we look at, we don't really understand, you know, what it symbolizes as, as it's actually growing. Uh, and uh, so that's it. The question did not specifically ask about pomegranates in the Christian context, so I'm going to keep this very brief, but we actually do see pomegranates pop up all over the place, particularly in medieval Christian art, and they are interesting. It, it is recognized, um, as uh, uh, Professor Trotsky has suggested, with fertility. Um, but it's also in Christianity strongly associated with virginity. Um, this is one of those interesting revalorizations, almost a bait and switch of these things. Um, but uh, you will see a lot of medieval portrayals of the Virgin Mary holding uh, the baby Jesus, and there being pomegranates somewhere around there, precisely because in her fertility and uh, virginity coincide. So from the Jewish perspective, pomegranates are, are a central motif that you find, especially in, in ancient Israel. Uh, I believe it just symbolizes life, uh, right, uh, fecundity. And uh, you do find it, I believe, um, all over the place. I think you find it in temple imagery uh, with, the, with the second temple. Uh, you find it on coins related to the Israelite priests. Uh, I'm not sure what the origins are. There must be a biblical text or two that we could turn to, to, to find why this is. And I'm sure that it was just indigenous to, to the region. Um, so yeah, pomegranates are, are actually central and they, they still do take, they still do play a role in Jewish rituals. Um, not with respect to Passover, as far as I remember, but um, with Rosh Hashanah, uh, the new year where you, you eat pomegranates uh, as basically sort of a symbol of, of renewal. Um, so yeah, pomegranates are, are, again, I think just one of these shared motifs and symbols that you find across different religious communities, uh, especially in the three that we're discussing today, obviously. I've posted a link to the host and to my colleagues from the Art Museum at Princeton, which has a few of the ceiling tiles from the synagogue at Dor Europas. Um, uh, just some truly spectacular material. We have very little of it uh, here in of the synagogue in particular here in the United States. Um, a, a lot of it uh, is in fact uh, back as it uh, probably should be um, uh, in, uh, in Israel and surroundings. But the ceiling tile gives you from, this comes from the third century and it has the portrayal of those pomegranates. Uh, and if you look at other ceiling tiles from that synagogue, you see a lot of symbols that are sort of moving between Jewish communities, Christian communities, uh, other religious groups, uh, Roman Sassanid, uh, imperial symbol symbols. They are the common coinage. Everybody loves pomegranates. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Sure. Uh, along those lines, um, one question for clarification, and then we're gonna come back for more questions of overlapping foods and symbols. Uh, somebody just asked for clarification on uh, Charshamba Suri. So is this historically Wednesday evening or Tuesday evening? Somebody would like to, a little precision uh, on their Charshamba Suri celebrations. But usually it's Wednesday, Wednesday evening. Well, uh, it's, it's the whole of Wednesday, the, the, but the bonfires and jumping over the bonfires tends to occur on Wednesday evenings. And again, I should add that while the jumping over the bonfire is not Zoroastrian, linked to it are a whole bunch of these purity aspects. So for example, in traditional villages, uh, the ashes of those fires will be allowed to die out, they will not be actually blown out or snuffed out. So following the sort of Zoroastrian aspect of the letting a fire die out on its own, and then in very traditional uh, communities, uh, it would actually be a prepubescent uh, girl who actually gather the ashes uh, and scatter them afterwards. So in other words, again, this whole issue of menstruation and not polluting even the remnants of the flame. Uh, so a lot of these sort of aspects being still pulled in 
uh, 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 and changed. Wonderful. And along those lines, uh, back to the sort of shared symbols and foods, there's a question from Lily about um, whether these celebrations do have specifically any sort of uh, use or overlapping foods. So uh, Dr. Mohtarian talked about the green onions. We know Syrian, or I know Syrian Christians will break fasts with fish. Um, so Lady here has used the example of fish. And so if our panelists would um, maybe discuss the potential for sort of other overlapping foods and symbols aside from the pomegranate. If you know. So fish, obviously, for Syrian Christian communities is uh, the food with which to break the fast. Um, but there's also lamb um, that uh, becomes very significant within the context of um, food consumption surrounding Easter. Um, and I think that's something that's, uh, that's shared between um, several of these traditions. Dr. Choksi? I, actually, what I was trying to do was go back to, I guess I was distracted, I was going back to the pomegranate and I was trying to pull up on and from my screen and show the audience of pomegranates actually growing and bursting on the tree. If I find that, I will actually show that from one of the photographs I took in Iran. But let's move on, and then if I find it, I'll I'll let you guys. Uh, 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 yeah, actually, I think I have it here. Let's uh, because it's something you know we just don't really get a sense of, you know, uh, in terms of the pomegranates we deal with. So. Uh, here we go, let me pull it up and uh, let's see uh, if I can share the screen here with you guys. Uh, um, share screen uh, and uh, you guys see the, the pomegranates up here? Okay, yeah, and so that that's how, so that's, if you really want to see the thing, imagine the symbolism of this, that, that's what it is. Okay. Great, yes. Um, I was just gonna follow up with, uh, because uh, for those who don't know, the large sort of meal that is used uh, and, and around Noru's is sabzi polo and mahi, right? Is a, is a, is a rice um, with vegetables in it, as well as a white fish. And so I think the, the question about fish and sort of the shared idea of fish comes from that. And so um, Dr. Dorfler answered for Syrian Christians, that is really the meal that is also the sort of the larger Persian world's meal um, to celebrate Norus. I didn't know Dr. Mukhtarian if there is fish in sort of the, the, the upcoming celebrations for Judaism, Passover, um, if you would like to answer that um, for our, our questioner. I, I must confess, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I, I think there may be a component in Persian Jewish cuisine that that somehow may be linked to all of this that that fish is eaten, um, but I, I must confess I don't I don't know I don't have a good answer so I would have to dig a little bit to find out but nothing comes to mind um, immediately I, I hope I'm not mistaken in that so yeah unfortunately I, I don't have I don't have a good answer <laughs> but I, I don't think so I think no I think I don't have a good answer because I think the answer is no <laughs> yeah oh well among the we'll Parsis take that of one. yeah okay. among the Parsis of India. Uh, both fish and meat side, whether it's, it's lamb, beef, uh, 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 fish, but also shellfish like prawns, a prawn curry will be thrown in as well. So uh, there, there's a, wide, a, a wider range, uh, 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 partly because of you know the different uh, items available in the Indian subcontinent. Absolutely. Well, on that note, we are at 310. I know there are a number of other questions sort of floating in our Q&A chat box. Um, we do have to sort of cut our time off here at about 310. Um, I hope everyone who has tuned in, all 90 some people who started with us, um, everyone who stayed with us enjoyed uh, the Q&A as well as the discussions from our panelists. Um, and to all of you, happy notice if you are celebrating. And uh, to my pan co-panelists, thank you very much for your time in joining us. Um, thank you so very much and now is Mubarak.
Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much to our esteemed panelists, uh, Dr. Chaksi, Dr. Mokhdarian, and Dr. Dorfler, and Dr. Baluchi. Uh, on behalf of Professor Mostofi and the Persian Studies Program, I want to thank uh, everyone who joined us today and for your questions. Um, for your information, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on the Persian Studies Program website. Uh, happy Nowruz, Happy Passover, Happy Easter, and Khodanagata. Uh,